Welcome everyone <clears throat> to this very special event with Judith Butler on the force of nonviolence. This event is brought to you by the Whitechapel Gallery in partnership with Verso Books as part of Feminist Resistance Strategies for the 21st Century, a program marking Verso's 50th anniversary, and also by the British Library, whose exhibition Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights, will have its delayed and much anticipated opening in late October. This, as you know, is a free event. And as such, we would uh, like to take the opportunity to ask if you can afford it, to donate what you might have paid for a ticket to a Black Lives Matter charity in the US or UK, or another anti-racism group working in your local area. <clears throat> so it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Judith Butler, though there are few people in the world less in need of an introduction. Judith Butler is one of the foremost intellectuals of our time, a philosopher and theorist who has reshaped and continues to reshape how we think about some of the most fundamental categories of social and political life, gender, sex, language, the body, the self, the human, the ethical, and most recently, violence and nonviolence. Throughout a most distinguished career, Judith Butler has also been an unstinting advocate for the rights of marginalized people, especially those who are subjected to homophobic, racist, and settler colonial oppression. Butler is the Maxine Elliott Professor in the Department of Comparative Literature in the program and the program of critical theory, the University of California, Berkeley, and also holds the Hannah Arendt Chair at the European Graduate School in Switzerland. Today, Judith Butler will be speaking to us about nonviolence, social inequality, necropolitics, and the possibilities for a politics of life. The lecture draws in part from Butler's new book, The Force of Nonviolence, published this year uh, with Verso. So thank you so much, Judith, for making the time for us today. I know it's very early in the morning for you in California, and I will now hand it over to Judith's lecture, and we will be in conversation afterwards. Thank you. Hello. It would be easier if I could start this lecture this way. When we begin to understand the enormous character of the pandemic, some of us expressed hope that this condition might open up new pathways for the future. One reason it is not easy to start that way is because we have not yet grasped the scope of the pandemic. And by that, I mean not only where it will spread and whose lives it will affect, but how long it will last and how irreversibly will it change our economic world. Further, it is sometimes difficult and for good reasons to distinguish between social events and effects that the pandemic and those that belong perhaps more properly to capitalism or systemic racism to name a few operative vectors of power. And we know the reasons for that, namely that the pandemic understood as a health crisis intensifies and exacerbates the forms of suffering that are experienced by those who are poor, who are black and brown, those who are disabled, those whose health conditions are already compromised. So at this moment, uh, especially in the United States where I live, the pandemic exposes a set of radical social and economic inequalities and seems to have become unthinkable outside the framework of social and economic inequality. I want to return to that in a moment for my argument will be that we ought not to separate social inequality from our understanding of violence and that the reasons for that refusal on my part are both philosophical and political. But still, let me return to the second part of March of this year and the early weeks of April, when it would appear the lockdown, the shutdown, the sheltering in place gave rise to a surprising form of optimism. After all, if the world was shutting down, that meant that capitalism was shutting down. If the world was shutting down, then all of its radical inequalities were shutting down as well. Arundhati Roy spoke poetically of a portal opening onto 
a different future. I will not be debunking those views in what follows, but I will be asking how they might be renewed within the present landscape. There was something about seeing the economic and social machinery grinding to a halt that gave rise to the hope that we were being given a chance to remake the world. And yet in May and June, and certainly now in July, where the reopening of the world has taken place in part, it appears rather to be a restarting of the economy as if the world could not or should not be anything other than the economy in its present form. Perhaps we were wrong to think that the workings of capitalism could suddenly come to a halt, that people would see the natural world renewing itself, come to lament the radical forms of exclusion and subordination that pervaded the social world, and start now to work together to produce a better world. Perhaps we were wrong to think, even for a brief duration, that the pandemic could function as a great leveler. We were not exactly wrong, but neither were we well prepared. <laughs> One problem was that the concept of the world, or rather the aspiration animating the idea of remaking the world, imagined it as a tabula rasa, a new beginning, without asking whether the new brings a weighty history along with it, whether new beginnings are really breaks with the past or can be. Another problem, clearly a deeper one, is that the economy very quickly came to replace the world in the mainstream public discourse. The health of the economy was understood to be more valuable and urgent than the health of the people. Indeed, attributing health to the economy figures the economy as a human body, an organism, one whose life and growth must be supported at all cost. But the transposition of health onto the economy did not just transfer a human attribute to the economy, it drained health from the body precisely in order to establish the healthy economy. That seems to be how the organic figure of the economy is now working. If the anthropomorphized health of the economy comes at the expense of the health of those who are workers, minorities, the poor, those with already compromised health, then the figure of economic health does not merely borrow the life of those bodies as it represents the economy as organic life. It takes that life, it drains that life, it expresses the willingness to sacrifice those lives. And in those senses, it is a life-taking figuration. The false consolation of the cost-benefit model is that it allows for the health and life of the body to be replaced by a number, a percentage, and a graphic curve. The latter, however, is not a simple representation of the living body, but in this context, the present context, it becomes the means of its effacement. The graphic sign and number is meant to show us how many or how few have died. And if the curve is flattening, we are supposed to rejoice because only so many people are dying now. And that is apparently good news. Presently, it provides the alibi to reopen the market economy and respike the virus. And in that way, imperils the lives and produces deaths. The point of the curve in the serving of market rationality is to establish the level of illness and death that we can accept as reasonable. The right number of deaths, the right extension of the horizontal line, the one that establishes the number of deaths we are willing to live with. And so it becomes the representational form that sanitizes those deaths or that allegorizes its general sanitization another borrowing from the metaphorics of health in the service of a necropolitical plan, exemplifying perhaps in a remarkably vivid form the death drive at the heart of the capitalist machine. No worries, I'm not claiming that the living body does not require representation. I am not even claiming that we have no need for graphs. We do. Bodily life actually depends upon representations that make clear what it requires to continue living. 
Yet the question remains, which representations will do? I'm not precisely saying that figures kill, but only that they do exhibit the trajectory of a form of violence that depends upon both transposition and disavowal for its reproduction. If the world was replaced with the economy and the economy understood as a market economy and a financial market was understood to be undergoing a health crisis, then it became ostensibly our responsibility to go back to work, to reopen the economy for business, to flood the churches and the gyms and the shops, even though that clearly meant that the virus would spread and more people would lose their health, even lose their lives. Unspoken here is the dispensability of those working lives, but also the lives of all those whose sheltering does not take place in a bourgeois household with closed doors and property lines. Unspoken here is the dispensability of all those lives thinking they are embracing freedom as they head towards illness and death, their own or others they may or may not know. At the same time, the safety protocols are not possible for everyone. What does it mean to shelter in place if that place is densely populated or a scene of violence or when there is no stable shelter? Or if one is in prison and there is no, no way to take the distance required? The older Marxist formulation about industrial labor without health protections takes new form within the pandemic. One must work in order to secure a wage, in order to live, and yet by working under such conditions, one increases the probability of one's own illness and death. That sounds dire, but the situation is dire, since now it has become clear, at least where I live and where many people live, the state-directed imperative to open the economy comes at the cost of human lives, and those lives are generally the lives of those working in service economies, but also those who have continuously through history been de deprived of adequate health care, and that includes a wide range of people of color. Here are some examples that you probably know. For example, in Brazil's uh, Sao Paulo state, people of color are 62% more likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterparts. Higher mortality rates have also been reported in the Seine-Saint-Denis arrondissement in France, where many migrants from North Africa live. In the United States, the COVID-19 death rate for African Americans is more than double that of other racial groups. Latinos constitute 34% of cases nationwide, even as they constitute only 18% of the population. In California, they represent more than 50% of the cases, and the death rates are increasing daily and disproportionately. As I understand it, the situation is practically mirrored in England and Wales, where the death rate for Black, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi people is nearly double that of white people, even when class and some health factors are taken into account. Statistics like these can tell us how many people are affected and die from the illness, but they cannot by themselves explain why that is the case. To do that, we have to consider slow forms of killing, which is, I would say, suggest, part of what we mean by structural racism and sanitized death. Yes, violence includes overt forms of police violence, as well as the structural features of the carceral economy, physical coercion, battery, debasement, and murder. This has been the central focus of the anti-racism movement that has swept across the U.S. and many other regions, including the U.K., but there's another focus there as well, one that becomes especially acute under the conditions of pandemic. That might be understood as a slower form of violence. One whose pace and mechanism becomes nearly identical with the rhythms of ordinary life, or at least with the accepted rationale for work under conditions that guarantee the loss of life. 
Most people don't imagine that they are regarding other lives as dispensable, leaving them to die by accepting a rationality of this kind. They do not recognize the form that this complicity takes. For letting another die is not precisely a sovereign decision over who should live and who should die. And yet in some sense, the decision does take place, whether through a fugitive form of sovereignty or by virtue of a biopolitics that turns out to be a necropolitics as it unfolds. Similarly, the manic celebrations of personal liberty after the lockdown involve forms of consumer behavior that involve large crowds drinking without masks, a great deal of homosocial body against body excitement, right-wing gatherings that defy public health warnings, even though time and again, those gathered fall ill and spread the virus. They are not vulnerable, or so they think. They associate their liberty with their right to do harm to themselves or to others. Although a personal liberty, and hence understood as belonging to an individual, its paradigmatic expression in the US right now is mindless sociability. Too few consider that they are indirectly producing conditions in which others are more likely to fall ill and die. They are not shooting anyone, but they are engaging in practices that facilitate the illness and death of others. The denial and their manic assertion, assertion of a personal liberty unconstrained by governmental regulation leads to another form of enthusiastic and self-righteous necropolitics. Is letting die a permutation of violence? This is a question that I think we should ask. The question of who should live and who should die is of course an age old one, and it is usually posed by those who do not consider themselves a possible factor in the equation. The one who calculates the acceptable level of death is not figured as a mortal creature. The act of calculation seems to lift that human creature who calculates out of the sphere of finitude. The others are those whose life and death can be calculated, but calculation saves the calculator from death, at least in the domain of fantasy. This post-sovereign or neo-sovereign form of calculation gives rise to a form of inequality that relies upon a metric of grievability, whose life, if lost, would count as a loss, even constitute an incalculable loss and whose death can be quietly calculated without ever naming it as such. Here is where social inequality works together with necropolitical violence. It would have laid out a clear path to re resistance had the pandemic only etched firmly the contours of inequality within our institutions, households, and public spheres, exacerbating for many the lived sense of peril associated with the workplace, the home, the street. And it would have marked out another path of political mobilization had the pandemic simply and clearly underscored the necessity of climate justice and rallied people across the globe to join in that impressive and urgent movement. Similarly, the communities of care that have emerged in the midst of this pandemic have constituted new social forms, life-giving, expanding the notion of shelter beyond the household and the nation. And the same could be said about the public art now online that has us listening and watching in new ways. But the police violence against black people, women and men, trans people, travesty, and the indigenous in places like Brazil, the poor in India coincides with the systematic forms of letting die promoted and accepted by the market enthusiasts during the time of pandemic. The murder of George Floyd and a long and lengthening list of other people has shifted and intensified an already pervasive sense of peril, not only because he was yet another black life extinguished by brutal police force, but because the spectacle of his killing was a shameless advertisement for white supremacy, a resurgence of lynching explicitly performed for the cell phone video. It is still the neck, once again, the chokehold, 
the collective trauma for Black people cannot be underestimated in its intergenerational and present form, especially now when so many Black lives are claimed by COVID-19 because healthcare has always been inadequate, inaccessible, or in unaffordable. The disproportionate number of deaths in communities of color more generally speaks to a systemic racism within a broken and brutal healthcare system here in the United States. The very same communities that are mourning the loss of lives that could have and should have been treated and saved suffers at the same time uh, a pervasive and preventable brutalization of black bodies on the street by police, but also by by citizens uh, acting, as it were, in solidarity with the police. If Foucault thought there was a difference between taking another's life and letting another die, we see that police violence that takes life works in tandem with health systems that let die. It is systemic racism that links the two forms of power. I'm not sure that these are competing crises or dueling disasters, police violence against uh, communities of color and the pandemic's disproportionate effect on communities of color. They are more linked together than that framework would imply. The systemic racism that we find instanced in this healthcare system that fails black and brown communities follows from the failure to institute healthcare as a public good to which every person should be able to lay claim. The demand that black and brown people work for a service account economy that allows those with money to stay home and away from stores follows from a system that demands that everyone work for a wage, even if the conditions of work are hazardous, when it should be countered by a guaranteed national income that would make sure no worker has to make that choice between economic destitution and serious illness. The questions of life and death that pervade everyday life under pandemic times are for all these reasons, economic, social, and psychic. When social and racial inequality are understood as issues of life and death, then it becomes all the more apparent that we have to understand the modalities of violence that inequality produces and enacts, and to combine the call for radical equality with a call for the end to violence. Whatever new beginning then is still imaginable will have to be one that takes on this systemic racism, this way of doing violence in its fast and slow forms, both the taking of life and the letting them die. So am I debunking the idea of a new beginning? No, not exactly. But if we thought people might gather and decide in what form the world should be renewed, we perhaps underestimated the pull of the market, its monopolization of the very idea of world, and perhaps, too, the very idea of health. To renew and repair the world, it will be necessary to understand that the extreme form of social inequality is to be found in the explicit and insidious power over life and death. We had, and continue to have, reason to believe that this death-bent economic drive can be countered. Not only the myriad social movements that are seeking to stop and reverse the destruction of the planet, uh, to end the last forms of colonialism in Palestine, to oppose every form of racial violence and indignity, they are playing a role, but the virus too plays a role. Even as social structures of inequality are heightened under pandemic conditions, the pandemic exposes a global vulnerability, and there's something to be learned from that. There is no one who has been completely immune. I mean, yes, there's a wide range of immunological responses ranging from asymptomatic to fatal. But to the extent that everyone is or has been vulnerable to the virus, well, that follows from the obvious fact that everyone is vulnerable to viral infection. So there isn't everyone or an anyone that can be or has been or is now infected, and that is because the body responds to what it takes in. Breathing, 
we know is fundamental to life, constitutes arguably its sustaining rhythm, and yet under pandemic conditions, breathing in or breathing out produces the potential for harm, even death. So it's no accident that as the coronavirus produces acute respiratory distress, threatening those afflicted with asphyxiation, the police in Minneapolis dig their knee into the neck of George Floyd to arrest his breathing and finish off his life. The virus, of course, happens to us and to some of us more grievously than others, especially to those with no access to ventilators and health care or who have over time and as a result of poor care, discrimination and exclusion never had the medical care that they should have had. Under these conditions, at once viral and social, the conditions of living carry the risks of dying. This vector of breathing in and breathing out tells us something about a fundamental dependency on air that climate justice activists have been teaching for some time. But it also asks us to rethink the usual terms through which we understand vulnerability, as well as doing harm and doing violence. Vulnerability is usually understood as the condition of being potentially harmed by another. It also names, however, the porous and interdependent character of our bodily selves and our social lives. We are given over from the start to a world of others we never chose in order to emerge as more or less singular beings. I say more or less singular because that dependency, however mediated, does not precisely end with adulthood. It is coextensive with life. From the beginning, an infant survives by taking something in. Uh, whether nourishment, touch, or air, something from the outside makes a singular life possible. That from the outside is taken in. We are impressed upon by the environment, social world, intimate contact. That impressionability and porosity define our embodied social lives, which is one reason why the radical individualism celebrate, celebrated by groups mindlessly crowding each other, breathing each other's breath, hands all over each other in home social delight, exhibit the inevitably social character of that doctrine of individualism. Perhaps we need to revisit Merleau-Ponty to tell us what it means that what, when another breathes out, I breathe in, and that something of my breath can and does find its way into yet another person, that we are interlaced or interlocked in this way. The human trace that someone leaves on an object may be one that I touch and pass along on another surface or absorb into my own body. Humans share the air with one another and with animals. They share the surfaces of the world. They speak to one another in loud tones and they sing with abandon. That singing together used to be a sign of a good day. They touch what others have touched and they touch one another and they are what is touched and they touch back. These reciprocal and intertwining modes of world sharing describe a crucial dimension of our vulnerability but also an interdependence characteristic of our embodied social lives. The unwilled and unknowing aspect of this interdependence is brought out most clearly by the virus that operates without our consent, against our will. There is no escape from that interdependence, even as safe shelter is sought and practices are honed. The shelter, the practice, acknowledge that interdependency, but those who under pandemic conditions refuse the mask, the shelter, the practices attack the very notion that our bodies are irreversibly implicated in one another's and that life itself depends upon an organization of that interdependency. I would suggest that insofar as interdependency is understood in this way, the critique of individualism makes more sense as does a notion of social equality that we want to defend and that relies on a politics of nonviolence. Vulnerability is not precisely the basis or ground of such a politics, but perhaps it is a portal, to use Arundhati Roy's uh, term, 
um, through which to understand social relations in another way. It is registered now within the grid of social inequality. One group is established as more vulnerable than another, but perhaps as well it describes a condition of life awkwardly and necessarily shared, the perils and passions of bodily exposure, of porosity, taking or letting something in, letting something out, existing as it were in that threshold and through such passages. When social inequality implies a greater likelihood of dying for some people, then the portal to the future is a more radical and substantive social equality, a more mindful form of collective freedom and a mass mobilization against violence in both its explicit and fugitive forms. If we seek to repair the world or indeed the planet, then the world must be unshackled from the market economy that traffics and profits from its distribution of life and death. A politics of life would not then be a reactionary one, nor would it be simple vitalism. It would rather be a reflection on the shared conditions of life for the purposes of realizing a more radical equality, honoring a nonviolent mandate, and discovering the conditions we need for a more livable life. Perhaps this is a way to begin again the world, even as that world is already underway, to repair forward, as it were, as a new imaginary emerges from the hauntings of the present. Thank you so much, Judith, uh, for that wonderful talk, um, which I think offers us a very powerful analysis of um, our current moment, which in, seems to me often a moment where there's nothing um, non-banal to say, but you, you proved us wrong in that case. So as you say, this pandemic is a crisis in itself, but also a crisis that exacerbates and kind of inflects pre-existing crises of capital and care and caste and race and, and climate. Um, and so it exposes, um, well, for those who didn't, or who weren't already well aware, um, our kind of profound and often unwitting interdependence, but also the interdependence of various forms of um, oppression. So it's no surprise then that uh, we have a Black Lives Matter uprising in response to George Floyd's murder in the context of a pandemic that in the US and around the world is disproportionately um, letting die uh, poor people and people of color. So what I wanted to um, ask you is, is this, is this First, is this thing you said in the very beginning about um, which which contain which was a sentiment that I think lots of us on the left shared, which was that we never thought a virus would do it, but there was this moment when all of a sudden the virus had shut down the world, by which we mean the capitalist mode of production, and this moment contained this kernel of radical hope, and now some few months later, despite I think glimmers of extraordinary uh, political activity, that hope is fading. Um, and the world, by which we mean, in this case, the economy is returning to normal and the same people are paying and the same people are benefiting and the structures of domination seem to be calcifying. Um, and so you say that we weren't exactly wrong to be hopeful and by here I think you mean the left, but that nonetheless we were unprepared or insufficiently prepared for this moment. And I want to know where exactly you locate this lack of preparation. Is it is, is it about um, a lack of a kind of compelling ideology critique of the notion of economic health? Um, or is it about being insufficiently inarticulate about the connections you draw between active killing and letting die? Or, or in general, how could have the left have been better prepared for this moment? Oh, <clears throat> I don't think um, that I want to uh, be involved in, in in blaming the left or in ourselves, including myself as part of the left. <clears throat> I I think rather um, that there were two responses. If we think about it, there were there were those who said, "Oh, this pandemic is going to only intensify inequalities um, and uh, produce greater degrees of destitution and abandonment for 
marginal peoples. And then there were others who thought, no, let us think about this. We are already acting and thinking uh, across um, uh, nations and languages that this is global, that this gives us a chance to come up with a, a different approach to healthcare, to the environment, um, and to and to the economy. Um, so, you know, um, I think there were, in fact, kind of two camps. Like <laughs> you were either a very intense pessimist, or you were um, you were trying to find the the this the seeds of hope. Um, <clears throat> but maybe all along, um, it was going to be a struggle, and not just between those two um, uh, views, um, sort of dialectically staged as as opposites, but um, uh, a, a struggle that is is the political movement itself, uh, how to establish conditions of work <clears throat> that are um, acceptable, that are that are healthy, <clears throat> that pay a living wage, um, and how to um, how to uh, to do that in a way that does not imperil people um, uh, or or, or leave people out. Um, so, um, so I think maybe um, we didn't understand what the what the struggle, what the terms of the struggle were, and maybe the oppositions among us were showing us that it that it would be a struggle of some kind. I think there's also just something psychically uh, difficult for uh, those of us who are deeply wedded to the practice of collective organizing, where all of a sudden it seemed like the genuinely morally right thing to do was to do what liberals had been telling us to do all along, which was leave each other alone, which of course wasn't really sufficient. Um, that's not what people really needed, but it was it was part in one sense of what people needed. And so I wonder if there was this difficulty, which was that, you know, people were retreating into themselves in part because of public health measures, but also because of anxieties and fears. And that allowed for a kind of, um, removal from the sphere of the political. I mean, of course, there are lots of counterexamples to that, and the Black Lives Matter uprising is the great counterexample to that. But I wonder if there's also something about the specificities of the pandemic. Well, uh, you know, of course, um, there was the initial exhilaration of not having to go to work, um, yeah. and then the desperation of having to somehow find a way of working online or uh, working from home when uh, the home is a place uh, that is not precisely calm or could be overpopulated. Uh, but, but, um, but more than that, I think as much as there was kind of bourgeois individualism that got reconsolidated, a sense of property and domestic space for some people, that was also very endangering for others. And I also think that for people who don't live in that kind of heteronormative domestic sphere, that it was a chance to produce communities of care. And I think that that was really admirably done in the UK um, uh, and, and forms of social solidarity that moved beyond individualism, mm -hmm. bourgeois property. Um, so there were socialist ideals, I think, that were being and are being, um, as we speak, practiced, um, connecting uh, the idea of care and shelter um, uh, to broader uh, forms of community care, and and I also think um, that that notion of communities of care doesn't necessarily have to remain communitarian. That is to say, mm -hmm. utterly local. I mean, there are those forms, and it is important who's getting food and who's getting uh, medicines and who's helping with transport. And all of that um, is is of course by nature local, <clears throat> but the principles and the interconnectedness are transregional in form so that we see uh, we see a, uh, an important politicization of care movements now um, uh, across hemispheres and uh, regions that that do suggest um, that there's another way of thinking about um, conditions of life um, communal shared interdependent conditions of life and how to take responsibility for elaborating the organization of interdependency mm -hmm. and 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 that is i mean we are interdependent in with relation to the virus right what you do affects me what i mean everyone around me we are all <clears throat> in each other's hands and exposed 
to the effects of each other's actions. So we're, we're never just caring for ourselves. We're also caring for others, whether we know that or not. And, and, and each of us is a kind of vector uh, in that way. What, how we treat ourselves it, it, it has immediate implications for how we treat others. And those, those forms of care are interlocking. And that breaks up, I think, the notion of individuality in a way that is long overdue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that that um, connects nicely with another thing I wanted to ask you about, which is which is nonviolence, which you touched on briefly here, but it's of course the major preoccupation of of the book. Um, and in the book, you urge nonviolence as I think it's very say a kind of political ethic or way of life rather than a kind of absolutist moral principle. And you don't understand nonviolence as a kind of state of passivity or calm, but as a kind of channeling of, a, it's sometimes channeling of aggressive instincts in a way that refuses to reproduce violence in the world. Um, and you say that a politics of violence, oh, sorry, a politics of nonviolence must go hand in hand uh, with a commitment to radical social equality, lest it reduce to a kind of defense of the status quo, as for example, um, in the condemnations of, you know, the violence of the Black Lives Matter uh, protests. Um, and so your central argument against violence, I take it, is that to act violently against another person, even in what's called self-defense, is to disavow this very fact that you're talking about of our kind of radical dependence and interdependence. So there's a kind of performative contradiction in violence where the self is erased through a denial of its radical dependency on the object of violence. But I, I wonder what you would say about those selves that are arguably constituted by relations of violence and subjugation and exploitation. So there are yeah. people, uh, those who exist at the top of social hierarchies of class, race, gender, and so on, who aren't just dependent on others, but who are dependent on uh, the violence that's done to others, right? And so I wonder, for, for such people, why would a recognition of dependence prompt an embrace of nonviolence, since that embrace would seem to threaten the erasure of the self, which is constituted by relations of violence? And in fact, don't we see this precise mechanism at work, right? So rich people, for example, who are very keenly aware of their material dependence on a wide class of immiserated people, right? And who thus know that those people must be sort of violently kept in check in order to sustain themselves. So, so how do we work from a recognition of dependence to an, a political ethic of nonviolence for people so kind of constituted? Right. Um, well, you raised several really important questions, and I thank you um, for the uh, the acuity of your questions. They're excellent. Um, uh, the, first of all, let me just start with this: that um, uh, that um, too often I think theories of nonviolence um, have depended on. Um, uh, the affirmation of a subjective disposition of uh, love or or passivity or the conjunction of love and passivity, the refusal to act in a harmful way and a refusal that comes from love of the other, a generalized other. Um, but what one reason I took up this 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 topic in this book is that I was wondering, well, what does it mean if we um, assume aggression as part of love, or perhaps it's opposite. Uh, Freud himself, I think, kind of waffles on that. <clears throat> and if we, um, if if it's precisely as creatures who are capable of murder, who are um, <clears throat> overwhelmed by murderous impulse, um, um, how, how, how from that position, do we develop an ethic of nonviolence? And I wanted an ethic or a politics of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sorry, uh, that would that would uh, work with that fundamental aggression. Not that, to say that we are only aggressive; that is not the case. But to accept aggression as a as a as a, a deep and persistent uh, component of psychic life. Um, and I I think that. Um, 
that there are arrays of um, of of accepting aggression and not acting violently um, that form the the key of for my um, um, for, for my thoughts on this. It's precisely in the midst of potentially murderous conflict that um, nonviolence is tested. Like how how to go about uh, practicing nonviolence there. Um, I mean, the performative contradiction that you name has to do with the fact that if I consider this self to be only self-interested and to be bounded by the uh, boundaries of its of its um, distinct body, um, then I I surely uh, misunderstand that this self is relational from the start, meaning that it is always in relation to others, and that that relationality defines its selfhood. It's not a bounded substance, philosophically speaking, but a, re a, a set of relations, uh, some of which are retained in memory or in the unconscious, and, and some of which are lived out in its actual present social and political life. So um, to do violence to another is to break a relation that defines me. And this is also, uh, I would say, a basic Hegelian point, which brings me to your last question. Um, what do we do about people who are, have colonial power or who are in position, uh, positions of enormous wealth and who are dependent upon workers and to exploit those workers? How, how does interdependency change that? Well, interdependency changes that if we understand it as a form of equality. And in my view, I'm, I'm trying to uh, elaborate a notion of interdependency that would imply social equality, but not just the equality that we establish among individuals, which takes us back to the individual as the basic unit. I'm trying to understand interdependency as, as a social relationship that if lived out properly, would imply equality. So, so colonial exploitation is not exactly interdependency in the ways that I'm trying to stipulate it. It is expo the, ex the exploitative um, um, uh, relationship to a, to a dependent other. Um, and in an effort to shore oneself up as, as independent, uh, even though it is a contradiction, if one's independence is dependent upon those who are dependent upon you. Right, and Hegel shows what the what the, the contradiction of that is, and and Marx, in some sense, also laid out why the proletariat know precisely that formulation and seek to expose it and overcome it for what it is. Great, I have so many questions, but so I'm going to ask you one final question and then move on to some of the excellent questions we're getting uh, through the Q and A. Um, so you you connect in both in, in the book and um, in this lecture today the ethic and politics of nonviolence with uh, the politics of life. And so you ended your lecture, for example, by suggesting that um, this is maybe what the pandemic presents us an opportunity for, to embrace a politics of life, which would insist, as you say, on the equal value or you know, grievability of all people and would reject forms of violence, both fast and slow. But as you yourself anticipate, the notion of a politics of life carries within it certain kinds of reactionary possibilities. So I'm thinking here not only, for example, about the pro-life movement that seeks to tell women, uh, tether women to their bodies um, and social roles as instruments of reproduction, but also, for example, to the ideological work performed by the Zionist discourse of a right to exist, um, as well as eco fascist celebrations of life force of nature, as opposed to you know the destructive scourge of reproducing humans. Um, so yeah, so on one hand we have you know this very powerful powerful invocation of the notion of life in the slogan Black Lives Matter, but we also have a very troubling history of the notion of life and its associated notion quality of life. Um, being mobilized for a reactionary end. So I'm just wondering how you navigate that as you put together or offer a politics of life. Yes, yeah, no, it's 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 a very um, complex field and uh, and very tricky. Um, I mean, I do I do think that um, uh, what I'm concerned with are, are are conditions of life. What are what are what are just fair equitable conditions of life? Um, how do we think about the, the reproduction of life at, um, on the grounds of equality? How do we think about um, 
How do we think about uh, the infrastructures of care or of uh, economic support that would be um, equitable in in character? How, how do we organize the conditions of life in order to realize um, basic uh, normative um, principles such as equality and freedom and justice? Um, uh, and and I think. Um, uh, I think that uh, we can't really talk about life apart from the condition of life. Um, and when we talk about Black Lives Matter, we are talking about condition in which Black lives systematically fail to matter or fail to register or are considered dispensable uh, or are considered to be those who, who, who are not deserving of care and attention or mourning and grief in the ways that white lives are. So the conditions of life carry with them, in, in these cases, a structure of social inequality and reproduce those structures. So I think we have to also ask, how are the conditions of life reproduced? And this is, it's a Marxist question, but it's also, I think, a basic question that we get from the phenomenological tradition as well. Um, I think, of course, uh, the right to life, uh, the right to life movement always has a specific notion of life involved. It has made value uh, judgment that the life of the uh, fetus is more valuable than the, than, the, than the condition of life for women uh, who may or may not decide to bring a pregnancy to term. And so there's there's a war about whether we have or, or those who bear children, okay, with gender careful here, uh, those who with the capacity of children um, uh, uh, should be able to determine the conditions of their life and to to determine the conditions of of of, of bearing a child, and and that sphere of autonomy economy is, of course, under attack, not just by the so-called pro-life movement, um, but also by the uh, anti-gender ideology movement, which is, I think, the, the newer global frame for this attack on reproductive freedom. Um, the right to exist, I mean, um, well, the right to exist when, when, when put forward by a settler colonial state like the state of Israel is, is a right for the state to exist. I think it gets, it plays upon the idea that the, that the Jewish population as such has a right to exist. And of course, the Jewish population as such does have a right to exist. There's no question about that. Um, but if the, the right of the state to exist is the way of guaranteeing or is or is advertised, promulgated as uh, the guarantee of the continuation of Jewish life as such, that anyone who opposes the state of Israel is, is in some sense jeopardizing the future life of the Jewish people. And that is, I think, a nefarious kind of argument. Um, it could even be argued that the state of Israel has done more to imperil Jewish life than, than, than most people um, uh, would, would, would concede. So I think we, we need to think analytically about, about how that kind of argument is made. Right. I mean, the, the invocation, these invocations of life are, of course, highly ideological, right? They're, they're presenting supposedly universalist claims, but actually are making very particular claims that um, offer differential protections for different kinds of lives. But it's interesting in this connection that someone like Gandhi um, at least on sort of Faisal Devji's reading of him in The Impossible Indian. Um, uh, you know, reads Gandhi as, um, as rejecting life as a value and saying that genuine nonviolence has to be oriented in some sense towards death and self-sacrifice um, because it is the pursuit of life that um, produces the kind of ills of modernity, right? That creates forms of violence, both fast and slow, uh, because it brings with it always a kind of instrumentalist logic. Yes, you just froze. I'm wondering if I'm on. I'm gonna presume I am on. Um, 
thank you. I think um, I, I also agree that life can be overestimated in the sense that um, if we think about life as in my life, my my egoistically oriented life, um, life as a matter of preservation or self-enhancement, then, then the pursuit of my life at the expense of all other ethical values is indeed a problem. And I think we need to decenter, if not diminish, the notion of my singular life um, so that we actually under, come to understand ourselves more profoundly as socially related. Now, if the conditions of life are social and we are ourselves um, socially relational, then it would appear to me that um, we've moved beyond a Hobbesian idea of self-interest or a, you know, a, a more generally classical liberal notion of self-interest and self-preservation. Not that I'm against that. I mean, people should preserve themselves. But the conditions of preservation, of self-preservation, are social and economic, and we need to move away from the monadic and individualistic structure in order to... Um, in, in order to, to really uh, embrace uh, and work with that social notion. I think I've lost Amia, so I'm going to go a little further and um, take a question from the chat. In thinking precarity with your conception of grievable lives and the death drive, how can we make it palatable for the hyper-individualistic Western subject to problematize mass death uh, elsewhere. Um, how can we make it palatable for the hyper-individualistic Western subject to problematize mass death elsewhere? Well, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, the individual subject is very often identified with a community and a nation or with a class. Um, and with a geopolitical position, it's their set of presuppositions. So even though that um, that hyper individualistic subject that you are talking about seems to be just an individual who thinks the rest of the world is very far away and shouldn't have to think about it, um, that individualism is a social form, right? And we we obviously know this from McPherson and and others who have worked on the social history of individualism. And it's a social form that's, I think, uh, you know, supported by, um, by, by capitalism, by a market economy, by an, a notion of self-interest and self-preservation, an entire ontology of individualism course with a set of social and economic forms. So I want to unpack that first. But then secondly, you know, when we talk about elsewhere, um, it, it seems one the pandemic shows us is that what's happening elsewhere happens here, that um, that what happened in England happens in New York, or what happens in California then happens in the UK, or in, in India, or in China. Um, uh, and, and we are um, interacting even when we imagine ourselves to be very distant from one another. Um, and that's, I think, what the, 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 the pandemic brings the global into a kind of visceral proximity uh, that it otherwise um, would not have. Uh, I, I'm not really um, saying that we should think about um, uh, expanding our notions of compassion or empathy. That may well be a good thing to do. But I am interested in how certain populations are considered to be highly grievable and by that, I mean, they, they are protected and safeguarded because if they were lost, it would be terrible. And other populations are, especially from within the framework in the U.S. where I live, other populations, you know, their loss is like, well, I don't know. Is that a loss? Did that really happen? Does it really matter? Um, and, that, and, and that's not just, grievability doesn't just apply to those who have already been lost. It it's also a way of thinking about living populations. Some of them are more valuable and must be saved from death. Some of them are less valuable and their death may not even register as a loss. So I think we need to have a, a, a metric, we need to analyze and criticize this metric of grievability that is implicit in our ideas of the global. And I do believe that thinking about equal grievability would 
change our um, our reigning ideas of equality, our reigning paradigms of equality. Welcome, Amia. I'm so sorry, internet failure. Happens. <laughs> Were you we're asked, answering? We're dependent on technology. I, I was answering a, 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 an, an interesting question about precarity, grievability, and how would a hyper-individualistic subject uh, respond to mass death elsewhere? How, how could that subject mm. how to respond to mass death elsewhere? Uh, elsewhere. May I ask a, a, a question that was in the Q&A that I thought was so interesting? Um, the question reads, are graphs a way of world making? What kind of graphs would we use in order to world make in accordance with radical politics? Well, I actually have been waiting for this. I, I, I would love to see uh, graphic artists um, engage some of these graphs upon which we rely and try to remake them so that we can, we can see what's happening in different parts of the world at the same time. We can understand the differential ways in which the virus is affecting populations visually. We can also call into question the status of the graph and the line as uh, an adequate way of understanding life and death. Um, and my, my deep worry is that, oh, the line, it's like, it's much lower now. Everything's good mm -hmm. back to work. <laughs> the line is lower. That means you have decided the acceptable level of death. I mean, how do we make that graphic? Well, how do we make life and death graphic in relationship to the, the graphic convention of the line and the curve? Mm -hmm. That I would love to see. Maybe it's already happening and I just don't know. Do we have time for one more question? Judith? Uh, if I'm the boss, yeah. Yeah, you're definitely the boss. <laughs> uh, so this is another Q&A question uh, from the chat box. Um, and the question reads, what do you mean when you say that if the crisis had simply underscored inequalities, this would have clearly mapped a strategy of resistance? Has something interrupted the process of emergence? Um, I think that, um, that uh, it's, it's one thing for the crisis to underscore social inequalities. It's another thing for the crisis to establish, um, uh, to, to, to reframe social inequality in light of uh, whose lives um, matter and whose lives do not matter, whose lives have a chance of living, whose lives uh, have a very precarious chance of living. And I think that we, um, we, we not only have um, a, a problem of social inequality of, of that kind, but we also, I think, have a global public uh, health crisis, one that will become, as we know, uh, more acute as vaccines and antivirals go to market, yes. right? How much are they gonna cost? Who's gonna get them? Uh, how, 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 how many are being produced with the idea that only so many are necessary, right? right? Right. And 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 uh, how, how will these big pharmaceutical companies both act in a humanitarian way in the in the public eye, but also be plotting their profit? And where will the profit come from at whose expense? And we, we're going to see a very intense life and death struggle there. And we have to be prepared for that. That is that's that's coming soon. I think it'll be here by November or December. Well, that's a very specific timeline. That actually returns me to the question of violence, if you don't mind, and the question of violent self-defense. So you offer, um, I think, a, a very powerful critique of that notion, right? So the idea of kind of violent self-defense, the self goes uninterrogated in that question. So who who is the self and can that self really exist independently of the objects of So I'm I'm going to a violent, yeah, right. So I was just going to you know mention, for example, you know, um, invading Iraq on self defense grounds or having a huge military state um, that uh, engages in aggressive settler colonial projects uh, out of self defense. Right, we can see invocations of assault everywhere. What I wonder though is, do you think? What do you think of the 
the the you know the thought quite common in a certain kind of radical left tradition that there are moments of revolutionary violence which are specific and necessary and offer the possibility of opening out into something that's more egalitarian and non-violent or do you think revolutionary violence is always fated to produce more violence um i th i think that i have a, a much more narrow um question <clears throat> i think that that this question um, uh, goes along with any um, reflection on revolutionary violence, which is, is it the case that um, the form of violence that's being engaged in makes for a more violent world? Does it, um, can it, can it ever remain uh, a mere instrument, violence as a mere instrument for achieving nonviolent goals? Does can it, can it ever remain constrained within its instrumental function or does it become an end in itself? And um, so one question I have about violence is whether as it becomes unleashed, does it reproduce itself and become an end in itself or does it pervade the world and so diminishing our sense of expectation about uh, producing uh, a better world, a more just world, a more nonviolent world. and. So I'm not, I'm not saying I would never be in favor of revolutionary violence, but I do think there's always a question that goes mm -hmm. along with it. So uh, I'm, I'm a gadfly. I'm a gadfly. For, That's for, a, a for, great for, philosophical for, tradition. For revolutionary violence. That's my goal. That's my goal. That's fantastic. I think that's um, a wonderful note to end on, unless there's anything else you would like to say, Judith. No, I'd just like to thank you, Amia, for your engagement. It's a pleasure speaking with you. And thanks to uh, all of our various hosts um, uh, today. I really uh, appreciate the care with which this event was put together. Well, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. Bye now.